Good morning. So this morning we are continuing with our reading of Permaculture, a Designer's Manual by Bill Mollison. We are on chapter 2.7. So this chapter is called Pyramids, Food Webs, Growth, and Vegetarianism. And in this chapter, he kind of gives permaculture's answer to vegetarianism. Now he, I think, would agree with many people that vegetarianism is the best alternative given all of the factors that we have in modern food, food production today. I am personally not a vegetarian, but uh, I have sort of tilted in that direction in the past, and I, I totally see the, uh, the reasons for vegetarianism. So I can give all the arguments, and I think we've heard a lot of these arguments before. I'm not going to go into every single one of them. However, um, I think we can pretty much all agree that the conditions where most animals are raised these days for meat and for other animal products are inhumane, and that uh, the food that they are fed is wasteful because it could be fed to people. Now, Mollison does not really address too much the first point about the inhumane conditions, but, um, but he does uh, address it somewhat, and I'm going to kind of bring attention to, to that as, as we move forward. Um, he, he addresses more the idea that humans are at the top of the food chain and that every animal feeding into that and that the, uh, the, the human eventually eats is um, uh, that, that, you, that you have a wasted, uh, a lot of wasted resources by feeding those, those grains and things like that to animals first before you eat them. And like I say, this is a very legitimate argument given that uh, a, a cow, for instance, would eat 10 pounds of grain for every one pound of meat produced. And, you know, a chicken would eat, you know, probably twice the, the weight it would produce in, um, in meat eventually. So I'm not sure about those figures exactly. This is just kind of off the cuff uh, and, you know, things that I, I feel like I've heard, but I'm not entirely sure that those figures are correct, so don't go around quoting me. But the point is that to feed an animal grain and then to feed the animal to the human is less efficient than feeding the, the grain directly to the human. Um, so that's a very valid point. So uh, the, the, the thing that one has to think about uh, and that he starts addressing is that many uh, vegetarians do not eat uh, directly from the, the earth. And so what happens is a lot of the food that they eat is pre-processed. And so if it's not pre-processed by an animal, but it is still pre-processed in a way that is really inefficient, then it can be almost as bad for the environment to be, uh, to be putting all of this food through this processing before it's fed to the human. So if you look at something like Beyond Meat, where they're creating a very, very sort of a, a complex product, packaging it, shipping it in complex ways, that is very, very resource intense. So while it eliminates the, um, the inhumane conditions of the animals, it does not change the fact that you have a very inefficient product at the end that the human being is eating. And so you are, in a sense, at the top of a food chain that is, or at least a carbon chain, that is expending a whole lot more carbon and and wasted resources along the way than it really needs to. And so that's a problem. That's only gotten worse since Bill Mollison wrote Permaculture Designers Manual. It's, uh, at this point, vegetarians eat a, a diet that is often less healthy than diets that, that, uh, that meat eaters eat. They, it's very heavy in grain, and the grain is produced in ways that are very destructive to the environment, um, and also very, very much like overproduced, overpackaged, and, and shipped from long distances to get to you. So, um, so the, the, in, in a lot of ways, what, what Mollison suggests is that a vegetarian eating the diet that I just described is actually less efficient uh, than an omnivore eating a diet from a closed loop local food network or farm. So the point he makes is that 
First of all, it doesn't have to be inhumane that you are uh, raising animals for food except for on that last day of their life. And that is, unfortunately, that is an inescapable uh, part of raising animals for food. Um, however, on a personal note, one thing that I've found, over, found out over time is that there are many animals that would not exist at all if it were not for small farms. And so you would have lots of varieties of animals that would just go extinct if people stopped raising them for food because they are not adapted to living in the wild. So many varieties of hogs, many varieties of chickens, things like that, they just wouldn't exist. So if people weren't raising chickens for eggs, they wouldn't be taking the time to, to take care of chickens. And so many of these breeds would just die out. So that's something to, to note. And maybe, you know, as a vegetarian, or a vegan, somebody might say, hey, I don't care. Uh, if they're not born, they're, they're not going to have to die, and you know that's better. And so uh, that's a legitimate standpoint, but it's, it's also a point worth making that these, these breeds would not exist. Um, but here, the most, one of the most important things uh, to, to think about is that animals can actually take non-food products and turn them into something that's edible. And so stepping aside now from the whole humanitarian argument, um, if an animal is eating grass and turning that grass into meat that humans can eat, well, permaculture would say that is a legitimate use of that animal, especially if that animal's waste is going back into the system. And, and you know, one of the one of the things that's kind of missed by the, the whole top of the pyramid kind of argument is that animals are not just bags of food. Animals eat food and then uh, they expel that food as a waste product. Now if that waste product goes back into the environment, it is not actually a negative thing. It's a really positive thing because the, the animal becomes part of the food web and that's really, really, really important. And so you have all of this what we call waste which is actually supercharged compost that is made in the process of 24 hours. And so instead of taking your food scraps, putting them into your compost, turning it and turning it and turning it for weeks to keep it hot, all you have to do is feed it to a rabbit. And that rabbit poops out exceptional compost that can be almost immediately delivered to your garden. And so you have these mega composters uh, that can work with you and can help to produce this uh, you know, amazingly diverse ecosystem. Second, these, and many of these animals will eat things that you will not eat. So they can eat your food scraps, which is great. Instead of putting your food scraps in the compost, you put it through the animal and then put it in the compost or just put it directly in the garden, depending on the kind of uh, food, the kind of animal waste. But, but they also can eat things that are much more diverse and that are easier to grow than food crops. And so they can help you clear land. Goats can help clear land, for instance. Chickens help do this too. Uh, and then in, in the process, they're creating usable products, whether it be eggs, milk, or meat. And so um, if you're not feeding them grain, that whole argument becomes nullified if you're feeding them things that can be diverse and then can be regrown more easily and are part of the ecosystem and a part of a more diverse ecosystem, it's actually net gain for the environment, not a net loss. So it's more efficient to feed uh, animals that are going to be used for food that way and then use them as food themselves than it is for a vegetarian or vegan to buy their food as you know, prepackaged, formed uh, beyond meat burgers from you know chemically <laughs> grown agriculture. So, um, so that's really important to note. Um, you know, a vegetarian diet can technically be a whole lot less efficient than a closed loop small farm diet. Um, so, so then. Ooh, Mollison kind of goes, goes on to just sort of clarify what is responsible vegetarianism. Um, and that would be, you know, eating locally produced food, um, eating 
easily prepared food, so things that aren't overly packaged like like pretend meat burgers, um, eating non-packaged food, you know, just straight from the garden, eating things that, uh, that you can grow. Um, so that would be ideal, obviously, but otherwise eating locally and eating more responsibly and not eating lots of grain because grain is, even organically produced grain, grain is a net negative on the environment. That's just, it, you know, I, I don't need to argue that right now, but that is just, a, it's pretty much a, a, a true fact. Um, so then he goes on to talk about responsible omnivores. Um, you would only eat animals that were grown in a caring environment. You would only eat animals that were produced in a diverse landscape in a closed loop system where their waste went back into the system and then the system produced food and then the waste went back into the system. So there's no, no loss in that system. Um, there's no negative in that system. It's all positive. It's all building on itself. It's all getting better and better with time. Um, and if they were eating things that humans would not otherwise eat, like food scraps that we would compost, well, feed them to the animals, you get another loop in that cycle and, and another benefit from that cycle. And then things that, uh, you know, that they're foraging on their own uh, out in, you know, around your property, that is also another source of food that's very responsible. Um, and then he goes on to even talk about a responsible carnivore and who that, you know, that would be. And that would be somebody who is living in a place where it was difficult to grow food and that could be uh, in the, you know in in colder regions. It could also be in cities. It could potentially be in uh, a desert area. So these are you would be eating food that was produced or was grown in the wild, and then moved a short distance uh, for eating. Now talking about cities, that's kind of ar arguable there. I mean, but. Um, but it is a very efficient way of packing lots of nutrition into a small uh, package and sending it short distances. If you're sending anything long distances, it becomes very inefficient. Finally, flushing our waste into the sea is very inefficient. And so uh, we shouldn't be doing that, obviously. And so as responsible eaters in general, our waste should be going to something productive. Now, Mollison has, in other sections of the book, suggested that um, a good way to reuse waste would be in uh, what he calls fuel farms. So a city can be moving its waste to a place where you can then grow trees and you know and other types of fuel that could come back and power the city. So that is responsible use of our own waste and vegetarian, vegan, or carnivore or omnivore, that should be part of our society, it's not. And so anything you can do in your own landscape to, um, to improve on that is ideal. Um, the use of urine as a fertilizer is a good example of that. That's something that people can do, stop wasting uh, water, flush water for that purpose, uh, as long as it's not you know, filled with uh, uh, prescription drugs and that sort of thing, uh, then it is a, it is a, is a healthful additive uh, if you water it down to certain um, kinds of plants. So just something to think about. Um, you know, so overall, Mollison would argue and argues in this chapter that the most efficient system regardless of how you're eating, the most efficient system is a closed loop permaculture farm. And I think I would agree with him on that, uh, that if you're talking pure efficiency, that is absolutely the case. Once again, it does not entirely address the humane issue of uh, slaughtering animals. And so if that's something you feel very, very strongly about, then veganism or vegetarianism may be the way to go, but either way, one should aim toward local food production and, if possible, hyper-local food production in your own backyard. So that is uh, Permaculture, a Designer's Manual, Chapter 2.7. Uh, 
I hope you learned something from this. I'd be very interested to hear what you think about Mollison's take on vegetarianism, veganism, and that sort of thing. So please feel free to respond below, but please give me a thumbs up and I would love it if you would subscribe and check out foodforestgardenclub.org. We are getting together, talking about interesting stuff and uh, swapping seeds, swapping plants. In fact, I've got somebody coming over this morning for some seeds, so I gotta run. All right, thanks a lot, have a great day.